1 John 3, and, and just uh, to continue our study of how we examine our faith, if you will. How do we know that we're saved? That, that, that big question. And it's not a big question to you. It should be a big question. You know, how do you know that we're saved? You know, and it's not because, um, and as we, I'm, this is the third week I'm saying it, but it's not because some preacher told you you were saved or uh, because you feel like you're saved sometimes. Um, it's not because you, know, you go to church or you've been baptized. It's none of those things, right? Those, those aren't a good place to base your salvation. You shouldn't say, well, I'm saved because of this, or I'm saved because I went forward one time, or I'm saved because, uh, just, you know, fill in the blank, you know, use your imagination, right? Because all those things can, uh, can falter at some point, right? I, I wouldn't want to base uh, my faith on anything that can waver on my emotion or on the opinion of somebody else, you know, or, well, you act like you're saved, you know, sometimes, and, and I don't want to base my salvation on something uh, that fluid or that, that, that's not that strong. I want to be able to base my salvation on something that the Lord said. You know, what, what better place to, to put your, your faith and trust, you know, in your assur the assurance of your salvation. And that's what the purpose of us studying in 1 John. 1 John uh, goes through these questions and it gives us different reasons and different questions to ask ourselves, to ask our secret selves. I've, I've talked about that already. You know, we ask these questions to the, to the people that, that, that only we know, to the person that only we know, rather, right? Uh, uh, Y'all don't, don't know me. Uh, as well as uh, as well as my wife does, goodness, my poor wife. I tell her that I was talking about that the other day. I, I, I ask her this question somewhat frequently, you know, halfway joking but halfway serious. You know, what were you thinking when you married me, right? And and she knows me better than anybody. But you know, that's the that's the person even even deciding me that I that I'm embarrassed about, if you will, uh, uh, in front of my wife. That's the person you got to look inward to when it comes to asking these questions, am I really saved? You know, uh, you know, do I have Christ in my heart? Um, uh, is my salvation real? And like I said, the book of 1 John, it gives us some questions that we can ask ourselves, uh, some questions that we've already approached and have already kind of gone over in the first two chapters. The first question was, do we have fellowship with God or would we rather walk in sin, uh, in sin and darkness? You know, so there's a question you can ask yourself. Do I enjoy fellowship with the Lord, or would I rather be off uh, doing something else? And would I rather off, uh, be off uh, committing sin or doing something sinful? All right? there's the first question you should ask yourself, uh, whether uh, as uh, evidence of salvation, rather. Um, next question is, do we, try, do we try and say we have no sin, or do we say that we're not really that bad? Do we try to justify our actions? A true Christian will recognize their sin and understand that they need to ask forgiveness of God. Now, we, we've, I've had this question come up uh, a lot, really, the past, probably in the past six months of, how can I do this if I'm a Christian? All right? How can I call myself a Christian if I fell into this sin or if I've slept up here or if I've done this? All right? And I'll, I'll be the first person to tell you, the Bible says it's actually, if you're worried about that, if that question is going into your mind and you're worried about that sin that you committed and why you might not feel as much remorse as you should, let's say, that's actually more evidence that you are saved than, than you're not. Why? Because you're worried about it. Man, you're asking the question like, what is wrong with me? What did I do this for? That's what a Christian is going to do, right? That doesn't make sense. If you don't have uh, the Lord in your heart, those kind of thoughts might not cross your mind. You might go off and, 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 and have a, a crazy, debauched weekend and not think nothing about it on Monday, other than you ha might have a headache from a hangover, right? Other than that might be the only thing that you regret. Man, I got a headache. But a Christian, if a Christian tries to go out and live that lifestyle, uh, there's something's going to start tugging at their heart at some point. The Lord's going to start telling them that just their, their new being, their new man, if you will, the new woman that lives in their heart, right? Paul says when we get saved, it's like we become a new person, right? It's like a, a, a dead person being made alive what Paul likens it to. So that new person, that new living part of our soul will start to start to pull at you and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And it's going to bring you, you sadness. It's, going to, it's just going to mess with your joy. It's not going to be good, right? So we, you know, to be that person that tries to say, I never sin. I'm pretty good. That's how I'm getting to heaven, right? That's, that's evidence that, that you're not a Christian, that we find those two things, those first two questions in chapter one. The, ne the, the next three questions we looked at last week in chapter two do we keep the commandments of God? And that's a hard one sometimes. I was just mentioning with Dwayne um, uh, this whole. Uh, I'll talk about here. I, I can agree to disagree with anybody. I'll be honest with you. If you are completely against the way I look at things politically, I, I don't care. I'm glad you. I, I'm glad you stand on something. That's that's the more important thing. Uh, but this whole uh, Second Amendment thing is, is near and dear to my heart. I grew up with guns. I was shooting a little single shot twenty two when I was six. You know. But what is God's commandment? 
All right, this is this is where I was talking about in the, the devotion in the bulletin. It's sometimes hard for me to follow certain things in the Bible. I know they're true, but man, I tell you what, my, there, there's a portion of me that wants to fight it. I hate to say it, but it's true. But what does the Bible say? The Lord, the Lord puts all authority into place for whatever reason. I'm thinking like, Lord, what in the world? Uh, and that, don't take me the wrong way, right? But in my mind, sometimes I'm asking the Lord, what were you thinking, you know, putting some of these leaders into place, whether it be with, with our state or, uh, or anywhere else? I think about Hitler, for example. You know, how in the world, Lord, could you put some, allow somebody like that to be in power? You know, and there's a, there's a side of me that wants to ask that. But you know what the Bible says? And I have to rest in it because the Bible says it. And the Lord is, the Lord is always just and he's always faithful and he doesn't do any wrong. Right. So I might I might think it's wrong. Right. But at the same time, if the Bible says uh, if the Lord does no wrong, it's wrong for me to think that way. Right. Or, or to let my faith waver like that. So do we keep the commandments of God? There's some commandments in the Bible that I have a hard time with. But I have to fight myself and kick myself, if you will, into gear to make sure I follow them, right? So the, I should follow the commandments of God, the ones that I know. And why do I say that? There are certain commands in the Bible that you might not have come across yet. And, and what, could, what an, uh, an example could that be? Let me use a, a very on-the-surface example that might not even really apply uh, to sin or not. But let me just put it out there because it, it's, it's, it's been an issue in some churches that I've been in, right? This issue of should we – this is an old issue, but – Pants or skirts? What should women wear? I'm talking about modesty, right? I've been in churches where it say that, man, you can't, ladies shouldn't wear makeup. They can't, they can't wear pants and it better be at their ankles. And, I, I, and they truly believe that and that's their conviction and they stand on it, right? On my point of view, I've, I've always, I, I don't think that way. Y'all know me. I don't, I don't think that way. Insula wears pants. It's just not me. So who is right? There's the question, right? So who is right? Why does the Lord let them feel so convicted about that and so... <clears throat> Um, almost dogmatic on that belief that that's how they live their life versus other Christians, both, let's say both groups are truly seeking the Lord, right? Both groups are really seeking God, but this group over here doesn't have that same conviction. So who's right and who's wrong? And I'm just using this as an example. I'm not trying to really uh, mess with your mind. What if we get, what if 100 years down the road, or let's say the Lord comes back tomorrow, and then he shows us which, which was right and which was wrong, right? Who was actually living in sin? You know, that's the question. If God tells us tomorrow and he, and he, he actually comes and tells us, he says, you know what? Uh, I, I actually support the whole skirt thing. I think pants are sin, right? I'm just using this as an example. But what if the Lord came and told us that? Do you think that, that he would hold that against either party? And I ask that uh, kind of seriously. Because both groups were seeking the Lord. Both groups really thought were doing what they thought they should be doing, you know, wholeheartedly, right? Would he hold that sin, let's say, against them? I, don't, I personally don't think he would. I, I really don't, because uh, if you're really trying to go forward, and, and, and other, there's other areas when I think about this, um, uh, I know some preachers, my dad example, we have, we have different views on certain uh, things in Scripture. And I don't think they're, they're big deals, personally, honestly, but who is right? When we look at the Scripture on both sides, you could argue it both ways, right? So you can kind of see truth on both sides. So who is right? You know, you ask that question. When, once it's all said and done, if the Lord came back tomorrow and said, well, he was right and he was wrong, did that mean one of us was living in sin and one was not? No, I, I don't think so. I think we were both honestly looking, uh, trying to find truth. The Bible does tell us the Holy Spirit reveals to us truth in, in, our, in his own season, you know, kind of meaning that we don't all get revealed the same truth at the same time, right? So anyway, when it says, do we keep his commandments, that, that doesn't mean the black and white. Uh, do we keep his commandments just like the most perfect person uh, in our church, right? As we read the Bible and as we interpret the Bible and as we understand and as the Holy Spirit leads us, how do we see God's commandments? How do they apply to us? That's, that's kind of the more important thing. You know, do, the commandments that I see in the Bible, the commandments that I have conviction over, those are the commandments I'm talking about, right? Um, so, you know, do we keep the commandments of God? You know, do you do your best to follow the things of the Lord that he has shown you? The next one there is, do you love or hate your brother? Do you love or hate your brother? That's, that's the big one. The Bible says in Matthew that, all the law uh, hinges on, on love. That we love God and that we love people. Do we love or hate our brother? There's, a, there's another one. And then the last one we've looked at so far is do you love the things of the world more than the things of God? All right? Are you okay giving up the things of the world in order to uh, pursue a better, uh, a more a deeper relationship with the Lord? All right? Um, yeah, so you know, that, that's, those are the questions we've looked at so far. So now this brings us to chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 1 here, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. 
Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Has anybody heard? Uh, you sing that song in Sunday school? Anybody? Behold what manner of love the Father. Anybody ever heard that? I don't know. We, we, I don't have a lot of time, but I felt like I almost asked Angela to see if he would teach. Anybody heard that chorus before? I don't want to sing it. I'm like, I don't know if my voice is like froggy or something this morning. <laughs> Catch myself being, I'm going to ask Angela, do you want to sing it real quick? Do you know what? You know what? Yeah. I ask Angela, maybe we might, we might do something a little different this morning. I think it's neat. All right, all right, go. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Anybody ever heard that before? Nobody? Man, we're about. To, I thought one reason I was thinking I wouldn't bring this up because I was thinking maybe y'all are probably gonna know it, and think I'm silly for bringing it up. But if nobody knows it, I'm half tempted we should like learn this this morning. It's just kind of <laughs> neat, you know. And it comes, it comes right from here. And the reason why that's so important, and it might seem like a a silly little tune maybe to you, but the reason why that's so important because here comes John, right? Again, this is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. He comes here and he says, "Behold, after all the things that, he, that he's been talking about, he says, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us." I mean, think about that. Do we really understand the, the love that God has shown towards us? I mean, think about that. That's something that we could meditate and think on for the rest of our days and I don't think really ever come to a complete understanding of it. And the best way I try to understand it is I would never give my son up for anybody. I don't care how, how good a person you were. It just wouldn't happen. Right? I don't care how much I said I loved you or cared about you. It wouldn't happen. But the Lord not only gave his son up for good people, let's say, but he gave his son up for the most sinful person you can think of. Now again, what's John saying? Behold what man has loved the Father. How can we understand the love that God has put on us, right? I mean, I don't even make sense. It seems like it, just go, it goes beyond words, doesn't it? All right, so anyway, I think we'll do it. It doesn't take, it's a simple chorus. So uh, let me see. How are we going to learn this? This is a fun song to do. All right, let's just do it. Let's just do it. I, I'll tell Angel just to sing it, and then as you're, as you're getting a grasp of it, just join in, okay? Fire, I'm putting this on YouTube. Just join in as you're getting used to it. Because there, there are musicians, there are singing. And then everybody else join in too. And there's something neat that goes along with this too, so. Okay, so uh, repeat the first line twice, and then repeat the second line twice. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Again. Behold, what manner of love the Think we got it? All right. All right. Now, this, here's the fun part. This is the fun part. All right. So, we're going to add something to this. Wait, do it one more time. Just, just make sure we got it. We got time. We're learning scripture here, so it's fine. We're learning scripture through song, right? All right, go. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Here's the fun part. All right, men, we're going to start this off, right? All right, can y'all men follow me? Okay, ladies, you're going to follow Angela, but you all guys got to follow me. Don't leave me hanging, okay? I'm, I'm sweating already because I feel like y'all are going to leave me hanging, all right? So uh, don't leave me hanging. <laughs> Jeez, I'm already getting embarrassed. I feel like I'm going to be left hanging. All right, so here we go. Here we go. Ready? All right. So guys, follow me. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God, that we should be called the sons of God. Some of y'all never heard that. That's kind of neat. I can feel kind of big now. Wow. Well, but what's neat about that is, is the reason, I don't even know who wrote that little chorus or put music to it, but the reason that that person did it was because when they, they, they read this, 
They start thinking, like, how can I keep this in my mind? How can I think about this and try to meditate on it? The Bible uh, talks about the importance of meditating on the Scripture, like almost all through the Psalms. Think about it, right? That's how you write the Word of God on your heart. So what this person did, he put a tune to it to try to help himself grasp this great statement from John. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Man, try to think about that. Think about the love that God has put on you. You think all day about it, right? You think about why he did it. Now and then think about why he shouldn't do it. Man, that's an even sober, more sobering thought. Why shouldn't God love me? And you can go all day with that one too, you know? But he, he loves you regardless. He says that we should be called, not only that he, put it, that he gave us his love, you know, so we could be friends or acquaintances, but so that we could be called his children. That's even, man, I don't even get it. We could be called his children. <laughs> you serious? I just, I, I mean, I laugh because my mind is so far from being able to grasp that fully. I'll take it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the gift, if you will, but I, I, I don't get it. I don't know why God did it, all right? But he did it. He, so we could be called uh, children of God, it says. The end of verse 1 says, Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Now what does that mean? It's fun to, if you're ever traveling and you feel like you're kind of by yourself and, and you run into another Christian. Anybody ever done that? And all of them, you kind of have like a, a bit of camaraderie there. You just kind of feel akin to the person all, 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 automatically. You know, you might you might not know this person from anywhere, uh, never seen them before. They everything about them is strange, except that one aspect of their Christianity, right? You start to see that, and you, you automatically feel akin to them. The world doesn't know that. The world doesn't understand it. All right, the Bible says there. Uh, Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Verse two says, "Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know." that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So just the hope, if you will, of salvation. And this is the, the, the Greek word here is not like hope. It might go either way, like, oh, it might not happen. It might, not, it might happen. Uh, the Greek word for hope that's used here, because we don't have an English word for, for it, basically means there's a hope there, but it is going to happen. Right? It's almost like saying, I can't wait till this happens. That's kind of the hope that it's talking about here. But there it says, again in verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. I love that statement because that gives us a hope for the future, right? What we shall be, right? What, when I think about that, I think of the rapture because it talks about here. Um, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. How in the world does that work out? Where we're going to be like Christ. And who we're supposed to be has not yet been revealed. I think that's kind of neat because I like to think about that in, 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 light, in regards to the rapture. When the rapture takes place, the Bible says in the twinkling, twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up. And also in that same twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed and be just like Jesus. I, I don't know. The, 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 it's going to be interesting. You know, our bodies are going to change. Uh, we're going to be glorified. You know, uh, scholars say we're going to have glorified bodies just like Christ. Um, those that are caught up in the rapture. And it says it's not yet been revealed what we shall be. So what are we going to be doing? Right? I, I pray the Lord comes back. Uh, one, of, one another thing that helps me reconcile um, these things, of, you know, this, like the things that are going on uh, politically in our country and all, just all the mess, even just elsewhere in the world. I used to pray to the Lord, one of the tests that we're going to come to here uh, in 1 John is that we're supposed to be looking forward to the coming of Christ, looking forward to being with him. That's more evidence of a Christian. And there used to be a time when I used to think, Lord, I don't, I don't have that. I don't understand why... I don't look forward to heaven like I should. I mean, maybe I do a little bit. Just the idea of it seems... But I don't really yearn for it. Like, like some of the apostles talk about uh, here in the scriptures. I don't really look forward to heaven in that way. It doesn't really pull at my heart, you know. Uh, the Bible talks uh, several times in the New Testament that we're, that we're sojourners here on earth. That we're not really supposed to feel at home here on earth. Yeah, I mean, of course we feel at home at home. But there's supposed to be something missing. We're supposed to feel that unease, if you will, at times. That we're not really at our in place. We're not where we're supposed to be at yet. And I used to ask the Lord, Lord, what is my problem? I don't, I don't ever feel this. You know, there's something wrong with me, because the Bible says here that that's evidence of a Christian, so why don't I ever feel that? Well, guess what starts happening? And I start thinking about, well, first of all, I was in that bad accident. Man, that, that was one thing. I can't wait to run again, Lord. I used to love running. I can't wait to run again. When do I get to run again? Whenever the Lord comes back, or I get to heaven. So guess what? Man, I can't wait to get to heaven, because I want to run again. Right now, I take all these other things into consideration. Everything that's going on tomorrow uh, with the rally, man, that makes me Lord. When, why can't you just come back today and, and sit on the throne in Jerusalem, and we can be done? You know, let us all just be done. there. Another aspect that, that causes me to look forward to His return, 
right? But as those things pile up, there's some more reasons that, that make me say, I, I don't want to stay on this earth. Good night. I'm not being morbid. Please don't think that way. I'll be here as long as the Lord wants me to be, and I will live in joy, you know, Lord willing, the whole time. But like I said, there's that part of me, I just, I can't wait till it's all said and done. The Bible says, I think it's neat, in the millennium, that, that all the weapons of warfare, right? Think about how many weapons of warfare that the world has. There's a lot, right? I, I got a few in my, in my house, you know, you know for, for protection. Think about all the, the money that the world spends. I'm talking the world as a whole spends towards, towards weapons research and you know, warfare and training and all those kinds of things. Think about how much money goes towards that. Now, what would happen, let's say, we took, um, we took all that money that's spent towards those things in the entire world, and then we put it towards another endeavor, that, that, that something that we needed. I don't know. Uh, something fun, maybe, like space travel. I don't know. Right? But you start putting all this money towards something else. What would happen if we did that? The Bible says during the millennium, when Jesus comes back and sits on the throne of Jerusalem, that's what's going to happen. All the warfare is going to be done with. There's not going to be any war whatsoever. All the money that goes towards that and all the, all the focus will be towards, uh, it even talks about farming, you know, and, and agriculture and things like that. You know what I mean? Imagine, imagine that. Man, that's, that's, that's kind of neat. I'm ready to live in that place, right? I'm ready to live there. But, you know, all these things that, that keep popping up, you know, that make me dislike things about this world. You have, you have to do your best to turn that around and look at it from a different, a different angle and say, you know what? I don't like it looking at it from here, right? But, but in, in all honesty, this actually is working for my betterment because it's making me look forward to, to the coming of the Lord. It's making me look forward to heaven. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, you can, you can take anything and turn it around and, and find something positive in it, the Bible says. But that, but that, that is another thing. We have to constantly remind ourselves. Yeah, the lost loved ones. I, I, I was talking to somebody at the hospital, uh, uh, one of the other workers, and they said that, uh, man, they can't wait to see, they can't wait to see their, their loved ones that have gone on before them. That's what makes them look forward to heaven. Anything you can do but to look forward to heaven. But that's, again, it's one of the evidences of, of, of salvation that we'll look at uh, in the next, well, we won't even look at it there about our time. Um, but it says, verse 2 again, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Now, what are we going to be uh, during the millennium? Uh, uh, ask uh, Stephanie, what do you think God's going to have you do in the, in the millennium? Or Robert, you know, what, what is he going to have you do in our glorified bodies? Lord willing, uh, that, that he comes back tomorrow, right? That we'll be caught up and changed in the twinkling of an eye. You know, what, what kind of, what are we going to be when, once we get there? Diane, what, what is the Lord going to tell you to do? And, and Tony and, and CD and, you know, you think about that. It's not yet been revealed what we're going to be. Yes, we're here serving our purpose, you know, and following the, the precepts and commands of the Bible. But we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I, I, it's a fun thing to think on. It's not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has the hope, you know, one thing that's important there, um, it says that when he's revealed, we shall be like him. Why is that important? Because the Bible says that you, you really can't look on the Lord and live. You, re you really can't, you know. So it's, uh, we'll be able to look at Jesus face to face. I, I sometimes wonder about that. How's that exactly going to work? Because when the rapture initially happens, we're going up to be with Jesus in heaven. We're not, it's not like we're, he's coming down here, if you will, to, and we'll be like, oh, hey, there's Jesus right there. Right? We, we can't go to heaven like we are. We're going to be taken to heaven for a brief time and then come back to reign with Christ. Anyway, it's a whole other study. I'm going to get, get, I like talking about it because it's one of my favorite subjects in the Bible. But it says, For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, just, just the hope of heaven is renewing. That's kind of what the Bible is saying. Just that hope. And, and again, hope is kind of a funny word for this, but just that, man, I can't wait for it to happen. I can't wait for it. And your birthday is tomorrow. You tell little kids that. Your birthday party is coming up tomorrow. Or we're going, we're going, to, we're going to, to the amusement park tomorrow. And you, you see that, that life come out of it. Man, I can't wait. I wish it was here today. And that's why the Bible here says it. And everyone who has this hope, right? Everybody that, that has this sense of, man, I can't wait till the Lord comes back and has this excitement. It says purifies himself just as he is pure. There's a life that comes in, into you when, when, you, when you look at it that way, when, you, when you're in that state of mind that, man, I can't wait till the Lord comes back. Something, something wakes up inside you that gives you a little bit extra energy, you know, just like the kids. They can't sleep when, they, man, they know the birthday party's tomorrow or, or they're going doing something special tomorrow. They can't sleep, right? And I'm not saying we might not be able to sleep, but something wakes up inside you. Something, something's going to drive you, something good, you know, when you start looking at that. Man, I can't wait till the Lord comes back. You know, it should give you a little bit of joy and a little bit of energy and just something to look forward to. Something to look forward to. It's important in life to have something to look forward to. 
You don't have anything to look forward to. Life isn't that great. Right? So you've got to have something to look forward to. Um, we didn't get very far in chapter 3, so I'll just continue this next week. Right? But um, at least we got to learn a new song. Right? <laughs> sing a little bit. Maybe, maybe we'll try it again next week. And um, You know, it's, it's so funny how that is. I'm, I'm so weird when it comes to music. I don't mind lead music, but when I think nobody's going to join in with me, <laughs> I got like, deathly afraid. Like, oh my goodness. Give me a, give me a, a barf bag up here. I'm going to puke or something. Like, it literally hits me that hard. Like, oh man, I'm going to be singing by myself. Start sweating. Did I put enough deodorant on today? You know, this, this kind of thing's real through my mind. Nah, it's easy. Um, thank you all for being here today. We'll continue this study in chapter 2 next week and finish it, Lord willing. Um, but, you know, one thing I will encourage you, and I'll probably say the same thing at, at the conclusion of every service, especially while we study through uh, First John here, is to now, I'd encourage you all to look through First John. All right? They're probably the, the best doctrine, if you want to call it, they call it the doctrine of assurance. Um, the, the best thing you can really ingrain in your mind and really write on your heart is, is First John. I mean, there's other things, yes, of course, there's other things in the Bible. But you want to make sure that you can put your faith on your salvation. Say, man, I am really saved. And even at those dates, you're ha- those days you're having doubts and things aren't going well, it seems like the Lord's not blessing you, you can open First John and start asking yourself these questions. Do I love the commandments of the Lord? Yes, okay, check that one off. I really, truly do. And you're asking that, that inner person, that secret person that only you know, do I love the commandments of the Lord? Do I, uh, do I like sin more than I like the Lord? You know, and really start asking yourself, you know, do I recognize my sin or do I try to sweep it under the rug and act like it never happened? Right? Do I take my sin before the Lord and, and ask forgiveness? You know, and you start asking yourself these questions and you start checking it off. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, this works. And if, if you come across one of those questions that, uh, that maybe you're, you're, you're questioning, like, I don't know, Lord, about this one, man, take that to the Lord in prayer. He'll help you sort it out. Right? He'll help you sort it out. But it's a good, it's a good way to, to build yourself a, a foundation of just, man, assurance. All can go wrong, but I know I'm saved. You know, you see what I'm getting at? All can go wrong because I've gone through this checklist Many times in my life, I know it like the back of my hand, let's say, and I know I'm saved. You know, it's going to be, there's your hope. You know, you got to have something to look forward to. I'll go ahead and ask, uh, go ahead and do our, our singing. You know, if the Lord has spoken to your heart, you know, guarding anything, you know, we got, that's why we have our invitation up here and, you know, come forward. Uh, it's, it's easier to ask for prayer and it's easier to, to get prayer in church. And what do I mean by that? You're more courageous uh, as a Christian when you're in the presence of other Christians. And if you haven't really experienced that, uh, go try to try to talk about uh, things of the Lord amongst Christians and go try to take that same topic out to the world and talk about it. You're going to be a bit more timid if you're talking about it amongst uh, uh, unbelievers, right? There's just, just proof of it right there. You know, when you're amongst Christians, you have a little bit more courage about the things of the Lord, right? So when it, when it comes time for invitations, it, if you've got something on your heart that needs prayed for, you want to ask the church to... Pray with you on something. Hey, come for it now. Then we can all see it together and we can all be praying together. Right? So, um, or salvation, whatever it could be. You know, if you don't want to talk to me, all the, all the de- active deacons, past deacons, they're all willing to talk. You know, they're all willing to talk to you. So, uh, let's go ahead and sing. Be going to stand. We'll pull down the service.